civil disobedience is absolutely beautiful and elegant, and it has worked for centuries to debilitate governments who try to oppress. Don't get on the bus. Don't go peacefully. Sit down. Stand up. Block the aisle. Submit paperwork by the truckload. Don't buy a lottery ticket. That said, non-participation is only part of the battle. If you are dealing with a psychopathic adversary, which we are, <clears throat> ultimately that adversary will use overt violence to stop you from nullifying their authority. There are countless hours of films You've seen them. I've seen them. Go to YouTube. You can watch until your heart bursts of police and soldiers beating people into submission. Now, if you're going to protest, you better be prepared to take a good beating. That means you better have some protection. So when they beat you, it doesn't hurt too much. If they're going to use gas or pepper spray, wear swimming goggles. If they have clubs, wear armor on your arms and shins and head. If you are not willing to use active self-defense against true evil based on some deluded Gandhi complex, then you and the historical memory of you are going to be erased. Done. It is perfectly plausible for a person to fight in self-defense while maintaining his core principles. And when a militarized police officer is swinging his club or running after you in full battle gear... He is getting tired. He is sweating. He will exhaust very soon and can be overwhelmed by the crowd in a matter of seconds. One person grabbing a club is ineffectual. But two people, three people, four people grabbing a policeman's club makes it impossible for him to fight you. Carry 24-inch long zip ties so you can bind their legs and arms after you disarm them. Do not harm them. Turn them into luggage for someone else to carry. This requires close combat skills, a bicycle helmet, leather gloves with a good grip. It requires PVC pipe sections laced to your arms and shin pads. It means you have to train and run and learn to follow field commands. If you fight then there is a chance. The only way to win, however, is with overwhelming numbers. It requires five or ten to one just to hold your own. Fifty to one is better, but you must move like disciplined units within the mass. Have teams with five-gallon buckets with cold water in them to douse gas and smoke grenades. Wear gloves so you can throw things back at the police if they shoot at you. Wear body armor so rubber bullets won't leave a massive bruise on you when you get shot. Use non-lethal weapons like salad oil super soakers to make it impossible for mercenaries to see through their clear face shields or to stand up on pavement when they are pushed back by the crowd. Use flour or talc to add to the oil when they are soaked so they cannot see or breathe. Put 30 people behind a portable railing and push the troops back into the corner like a bulldozer. When you are rushed by troops, run around the block. They will tire long before you do because they are old and they are fat and they are loaded down with 40 pounds of armor because they are afraid of you. Run them until their lungs are coming out of their mouths. Now, recently, I've seen a growing contingent of people within the government that seek a fight, but question the concept of planning or waiting. Oh, they'll argue that planning is somehow impractical, or that there will never be a perfect time for action. This way of thinking has only been inflated by the latest events in Burns, Oregon. The Oregon standoff is a stunning example of how emotional action leads to failure and tragedy. Many will argue over the circumstances surrounding the death of Lavoy Finnicum. I have. Did he reach into his jacket? I don't think so. Was he reacting to being shot? Yes, I think so. I think he was shot in the left hip by the, by the mercenary in front of him. And when he bent over to, to grab that wound, the mercenary behind him shot him twice in the back and once in the head. I think it was premeditated murder, and I think the governor of Oregon should be held liable for it, and she should be impeached tomorrow. 
Were the police officers involved in fear for their lives, or were they out for blood? I, I think you can watch the film for yourselves and determine. They filled those trucks with bullet holes. They shot the windows out. They shot the, the doors out. Those people were crouched on the floor, and as the bullets got lower and lower, they were screaming for their lives. Ammon Bundy's brother was shot three times in the arm. That's as low as he could get on the floor. They meant to kill everyone in those vehicles, and they knew they were unarmed, and they knew they were on a peaceful mission to speak to the sheriff in the next county. They meant to assassinate them all. But they also filmed the whole thing with a drone, and we saw it. We watched it. The majority of liberty activists will undoubtedly assume malicious intent on the part of the government. I'm one of them because it's due to their track record of murder and lies. Everyone comes up with that same conclusion. That said, I would point out that while Finnegan may be dead because of ill intent on the part of trigger-happy cops, he was put in that position in the first place due to inadequate planning and leadership. A scout car or scouts Ooh. along the road hours ahead of the police roadblock would have been brilliant. A drone flying the road ahead to see if there was a roadblock would have been stunning. The argument that the FBI should never have been in Burns in the first place overlooks the fact that Bundy and the team, strategically speaking, shouldn't have been there either. They could have been in a far better position if only they had thought their conundrum through. Besides, the governor calling for federal assistance in the face of insurrection is legal, and it brings the Lincoln-like scorch and burn feds down on your heads. Oregon and the death of Finnegan are not failures on the part of the liberty movement, not at all. They are failures on the part of Bundy and his team, who refused to listen to scores of people. I'm one of them. I wrote to them. We have far more experience and knowledge in such situations the same people who tried to help the occupiers adjust their tactics and offer them safer ground and safer footing and maybe some legal standing. They should have been filing lawsuits and using political pressure to expose the terroristic tactics of the BLM to the world. They had the moral high ground for about 45 minutes. And then the socialist press went to work on them. The failure in Oregon is what happens when amateurs, not just in training, but in tactical philosophy, undertake a rebellion. Some will argue that experienced tacticians with the movement, and there are hundreds of us out here, refuse to show up for the fight and thus sentence the occupiers to defeat. I would argue that the Oregon standoff was FUBAR from the very beginning and was a rat hole that would have pulled the best tacticians to federal prison sooner or later. From its inception, it was doomed. Seizing the property violated the first rule of war against tyranny. Never give an enemy a target. Half the movement saw it plain as day. The ending, I believe, was far more peaceful than it could have been. It could have been much worse. A team of well-meaning but organized but unorganized and untrained activists thrust themselves into a situation beyond their capabilities and under the potential influence of agents provocateur. You saw it. I saw it. There was no vetting for random strangers seeking to join their ranks, no direct goals, no clearly defined strategy, only vague demands and notions. No thought of planning one or two steps ahead, let alone five steps ahead. A circus atmosphere inspiring public ridicule, and believe me, there was tons of it on every kind of social media you can imagine. The liberals were calling for blood. This is why most liberty tacticians had no interest in showing up to the Oregon standoff. Not because they were fearful. Not because they're sunshine patrons.